Our next speaker is Vered Karavan. And she is going to tell us about targeting non-human sugar for cancer theranostics. Yeah. So thank you very much for the invitation to be here. And I'd like to thank the organizers and you for being here to uh, listen to my talk. And uh, I hope to sweet talk you today into uh, my research. And uh, we are interested in our lab in uh, glycoimmunology aspects. Namely, we are looking at how the immune system is recognizing sugars, especially on cell surfaces. And we try to target cancer cells uh, to the sugars on their cell surface for killing or for diagnostics. So when you think about a cell, what is a cell made of? of? I'm sorry, it's very difficult to stand here, so I'll Okay. I don't see you very So if you think of what is a cell made up of, there are many um, building blocks, right? There are four major types of building blocks. You all know about the DNA and RNA, nucleic acids. We all know about the proteins and lipids. And we also know about the sugars, because you eat them all the time. So if you think about the number of building blocks, there are only eight nucleic acids, DNA or RNAs, there are 20 amino acids that build up the proteins, only eight, lipid, eight building blocks of lipids, and 32 building blocks of sugars in animal cells. So together, 68 building blocks and sugars are, in fact, the largest group. And if you think about the informational diversity in a cell, we all know about the template-driven process, where a gene, a DNA, is coding for the RNA sequence and the RNA sequence is coding for the proteins that we will have in the cell. And the informational diversity increases as we go down the line in this template-driven process, right? Because one gene can be uh, translated eventually into different proteins. However, the sugar expressions in the cell is not a template-driven process. In fact, there are many enzymes that attach different sugars to lipids and proteins and generate a greater diversity of the sugars in the cell surface. And what uh, people don't realize is that cells have hairs, like we see here. <laughs> so if you look at the cell surface, you will see that there is a very dense sugar coat that all cells have. In fact, any cell type, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, a yeast cell, an animal cell, it will have this highly diverse sugar coat or glycocalyx, as we call it. And if we zoom in into this glycocalyx, you will see that it is made up of sugar chains, like the M&Ms, but very different sugar molecules. And each shape here is a monosaccharide, one sugar unit. You know all about glucose and galactose. You heard them. You uh, tasted them in the milk. And uh, so there are many, many different sugar chains on the cell surfaces. These can be attached to lipids, or to different proteins in different ways, which I, don't, uh, I will not elaborate. And they can also be secreted from the cells to the outside. So why is it important to have this sugar coat? If you think about different cells as they develop, the sugar coat is very different between uh, uh, different stages of the cell development. So if you look at the sugar coat of an embryonic stem cell, it will have a certain sugar coat. But as it develops, this uh, sugar coat cha changes by the action of different enzymes within those cells. So for example, different enzymes will generate, one by one, will attach the monosaccharides into generating inside the cell this uh, sugar chains. And then it will be de delivered to the cell surface and uh, express it on proteins or lipids. And similarly, on cancer cells, you will have this sugar coat. And this sugar uh, changes, apparently we know that on cancer cells, there are certain changes on this coat. And many of these changes involve certain types of monosaccharides, which we call sialic acids. Sialic acids are no normally terminate the glycosylation chains, and you will find it at the terminal edges. So this is an example of the uh, sugar chains that are expressed on cancer cells. This is not, the, these changes are not random. In fact, they are affected by what happens inside the cells. So overexpression of certain glycosyl transferases or uh, downregulation or overexpression 
of glycosidases or enzymes that would cleave sugars, genetic modifications, epigenetic modifications, expression of transporters, all of these really cause the changes that we see on the cancer cell expression of salic acids. And another major important factor is the diet. And today I'll tell you how the diet can really affect the expression of uh, sialic acids. And focusing directly on U5GC and U5AC. And I will tell you the little uh, discovery that we had on this disaccharide here, which I'll mention a little bit more briefly at the end. So this is sialic acids. There are nine carbon backbone acidic sugars. You can see here the nine carbons. Uh, their acidity is uh, com composed from this carboxylate group that, we, that is found on uh, carbon number one. And um, these are the major types of sialic acid in mammalian cells. However, U5AC serves as the precursor for the synthesis of U5GC through the expression of this enzyme, CMP and U5AC hydroxylase. And if you look carefully, you will see that the only difference between these two sugars is basically this hydroxyl group here. However, this enzyme is specifically inactivated only in humans, but not in all other mammals that you eat. So, if humans don't have the ability to synthesize new 5 gc you would exp uh, expect not to have it in your system, right? Uh, but this is not the case. If you look into uh, many carcinomas, like um, breast carcinoma, ovarian carcinoma, liver, pancreas, all those express this non-human sugar on cancer cells. And you can see it here through the brown staining. And if you think about where is this uh, sugar coming from, now we know that we incorporate it through the diet. And if we look at where is this new 5 gc expressed, it's highly expressed in red meat products but also in milk products from uh, mammalian sources. It is not expressed in chickens, where the gene is also silenced, and it's very rare in uh, fish. So once you consume red meat, U5GC gets incorporated and enters and expressed on the cell surface of cancer cells. So the enzymatic machinery doesn't uh, understand the difference between U5AC and U5GC. However, the immune system can see this difference and generates multiple antibodies against this uh, sugar expressed on the cell surfaces. And if you try to really analyze human sera, you will see that there are many, many different types, isotypes, and uh, different types of antibodies that can recognize many sugar structures that on these uh, cancer cells. In fact, it's very critical to understand that these antibodies can recognize different sugar chains on the cell surfaces. So it's not one antibody that recognizes only the terminal sugar, but rather different sugar structures. And you, you can see, sorry, that some individuals have high IgGs, some individuals have both IgGs and IgAs, and some individuals have very low reactivity. And what are the consequences? What, what is serum? Serum? Human serum? Human blood? <laughs> Another question? Any questions so far? So the question is, what happens if we have this combination of an ongoing war between the sugar on the cell surface and the circulating antibodies in one individual? And this is what exactly we, we answered, uh, we tried to answer, and that is because 100 years ago, people suggested that if you just had this magic bullet, that you can target the cancer cell, you could kill it. And antibodies, this is what they usually do. If you target them, this is what all immunotherapy is about, to target the cancer cell and kill it. But here we have a very complex situation where the same antibodies have a dual and opposing roles. On the one hand, a low dose of these antibodies is promoting cancer growth. However, if you take the same pool of antibodies and put them at a the higher dose, you can actually kill the tumors. So here we have a, a very complex problem because the same antibodies in the same individual can have different and opposing effects. And this was really corroborated just recently from the lab that I just uh, 
I was trained in, uh, where they actually did this heroic experiment where they fed mice for their all, all of their lifelong, and they tested the effect of these antibodies to really show that this effect is real. But uh, the, these sugars doesn't cause cancer, but rather adds the uh, fuel to the, to the fire. So when we try to really understand if all these antibodies have these effects on the cancer, we developed a glycochip where we could have mimics of all the cell surface sugars, and then we tried to figure out if all the antibodies can signify between cancer patients and controls. So we, we screened around 400 patients and 100 controls, and then we figured out that only one antibody that can recognize this unique disaccharide with these two sugars could serve as a carcinoma biomarker, so it could differentiate between cancer patients and control. And where do we get this disaccharide? So normally, in the biosynthetic pathway, you would have a sequential addition of this sugar, sugars to generate these long sugar chains. However, in many carcinomas, there is a mutation in a chaperone in one of the, pathway, in the, in the pathways. And this uh, leads to a termination of the glycosylation and adding the sialic acid. So you would have short glycans instead of the long glycans that you would have on a normal cell. However, this sugar is not immunogenic, and this, the immune system doesn't see it. When you consume new 5 gc 3 or diet, this replaces the normal new 5 ac and now this, this saccharide becomes immunogenic, and the antibodies against it uh, can be used as a biomarker to differentiate between cancer patients and control. And I told you that these antibodies also have a dual effect. And indeed, we, uh, we uh, tested that on human cancer cells that we fed with new 5 gc to express on the cell surface. And we could show that indeed these antibodies have the potential to kill the tumors. So either through complement that generates holes in the membrane and, and uh, uh, cleaves the cells uh, uh, open, or through antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, where uh, natural killer cells come in, secrete uh, materials that uh, really dissolve the target cell. So these antibodies have the potential to kill tumors. They have the potential to be used as a carcinoma biomarker. And the question is how we can control that, and how we can mimic that and learn how they are being made up in actual individuals. So in our lab, we are trying to uh, first mimic this uh, diverse anti 5 gc response by generating um, a new 5 gc glyconanoparticles, and eventually to try to uh, generate specific antibodies with these systems. And finally, we have the CMAH mouse model, which is a human-like uh, mouse model where the, the enzyme to generate new 5 gc is also mutated. And then we can ask in vivo if these uh, antibodies are really potent. So today I'll just tell you about the uh, mimic of the diverse response and just give you the overview of our next steps. So in our system, in, instead of developing small nanoparticles, we really wanted to mimic how a cell expresses the sugars in a natural system. And we decided to use red blood cells. Red blood cells have the advantage that they don't have nuclei. They don't have the DNA inside. Also, they are red because they have the um, hemoglobin. So we can, and they are very sensitive to uh, hypotonic pressure. So if we try to break them into small nanoparticles, it's very easy to do. And we can wash off all their content and see by the color that uh, when, when we are uh, done washing. And uh, in this system, the, the sugars are really expressed as they would be on a cancer cell. And the, uh, the idea is really to take red blood cells from two systems, one that would express new 5 gc and the other one that would not express new 5 gc that, that would express the human sugar. And we, in this system, we would generate nanoghosts that would either be new 5 gc positive or new 5 gc negative. And to do that, we had uh, a collaboration with our Translink consortium, where they generated uh, pig knockouts. So pigs are mammals, 
that express a new 5GC on their systems, but they also have a knockout in the CMAA gene. So in that specific pig knockout, uh, the new 5GC is not expressed. So we took these two cell types that are either new 5GC positive or negative, and we generated small nanoparticles that are very uniform, around 400 nanometers, with a highly negative zeta potential, which basically tells us that the, the nanoparticles won't stick to each other in, in vivo in our system. And then we characterize the expression. Why do you want the This is really not uh, meaningful, the difference. In, in any case, uh, any number around above 20 is very, very strong for nanoparticles. So if we try to compare the protein content in these two uh, nanogo systems, we can see that it's quite similar. If we try to look at the sialic acid content using lectins that can bind different uh, linkages of these uh, sugars, um, it, it, we can see that it's uh, quite similar. And sialic acids can be linked to underlying sugar via 2,6 linkage or 2 three linkage to the underlying sugars. And you know that th these differences matter because, for example, you heard about flu. So uh, is, um, bird flu would only recognize the sialic acid in a 2-3 linkage. This is what the, the bird flu virus binds to. And the 2-6 linkage is what the humid flu virus would bind to. And the swine flu is one that would recognize both structures. So. Uh, the linkages really matter, and we see that uh, this is quite similar between the two different systems. And now we wanted to see whether also the new 5 gc expression is as we expected. And indeed, we can see that only in the uh, one of them, we see the new 5 gc expression. We can prove that by using pyridate that cleaves uh, the 7 and 8 positions uh, in, uh, sorry, the 8 and 9 uh, carbons in the sialic acid, which results in uh, uh, abolishment of the binding. So now we have a system of nanogos that we can use to immunize mice. And also in our lab, we have a microarray system where we can print nanomaterials, including uh, sugars that we have, a sugar library, but also our, our nanogos. We have an HPLC where we, we can um, quantify and analyze the different sugars. We print uh, the sugars or different analytes on the glass slides, and then we can analyze them uh, on, a, on a scanner using normally fluorescence. We can print around 1,500 arrays per run, which means we can screen around 1,500 different patients or different materials on our arrays. And this is a high throughput assay. Anyway, so we uh, printed our nanoghosts, and again, we could see that uh, the SNA, MEL, and GC expression is as we expected, the sialic acid 2623 and E5GC expression, and we wanted to see that these um, uh, prep, preps of nanoghosts are stable after we freeze and thaw them for the experiment, and indeed, they are stable. And now we used our CMH knockout mouse system to immunize uh, the mice. So this was done uh, with a Freud's adjuvant to, uh, um, uh, to boost the system. And then uh, two weeks later, the, the mice received another boost of the nanoghost and another boost after four weeks. And then six weeks later, we collected the, the serum and tested the antibody responses. And again, you, you can see that in the CMIH knockout mice, uh, using the CMAH uh, knockout nanogos that do not express new 5 gc there is no response to new 5 gc However, in those that uh, express new 5 gc we see some response. And in this assay, we just used just the one monosaccharide that is uh, conjugated to polyacrylamine. And, but that really doesn't represent what we see on the cell surface. And to really understand what, is, uh, what are these, these antibodies recognize, uh, this is just to show that the binding is really meaningful, and to really see that the, the, the binding of these uh, antibodies is as we expect to see from the human individuals 
uh, different patterns, we used our glycan microarray. And in here, you can see different uh, sugar chains um, that either express terminal NU5GC or terminal NU5AC. And it's very clear to see that uh, in, in these antibody responses that we received in mice, there is no reactivity to any of the NU5AC glycans. And I, I'll remind you that the only difference between these sugars uh, chains is the addition of this oxygen atom. So this is a very robust response where you just immunize with something and you get a highly specific response. Now if we zoom in on, into these different NU5GC glycans, and I don't expect you to read all these uh, sugar chains here, but you can see that um, they can recognize either two, three-linked sialic acids. So red means strong and blue means uh, low. And uh, either two, six. So in some mice, we got a strong response to uh, two, three-linked glycans. And in other mice, we got uh, a high response to two, six-linked sialic acids. Uh, we still can't control exactly what is expressed in the, in the mice because this is a natural system, really mimicking what we see in humans. And our next step, of course, is to try to control uh, the expression of certain sugar chains on these uh, nanoghosts and try to really get uh, or understand the rules of getting specific responses in those mice. Uh, eventually, uh, this is a peak system that you don't want to introduce into humans. But eventually in humans, the idea is to take autologous red blood cells from the same individual, generate nanoghosts from that red blood cells, and then introduce our antigens of interest uh, by conjugating the new 5 gc sugar chains into uh, lipid tails that would incorporate into the nanoghosts. And of course, then we will have a specific expressing uh, red blood cell nanogos that can be uh, introduced into individuals as an active cancer vaccine. Uh, eventually, uh, we, we also have a different system where we uh, use quantum dots instead of um, our nanogos to express different uh, levels of uh, sugar antigens with uh, different densities. This is really just an, an ongoing work which I don't have the data to show you, but uh, this is something uh, to look for. And finally, I'd like to thank all my group in, uh, in the lab and our collaborators, uh, Professor Cesare Galli and Jean-Paul Silulu, who provided the pig knockouts and the funding, of course. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Well, thank you for the fantastic talk, but I have to make sure I understood it right. So red meat and milk is out, but I can have chocolate and dark coffee? Okay. <laughs> okay, questions? Thanks, Bert. Um, I, I probably didn't understand something very, very fundamental. So the big, uh, um, the big study that uh, ultimately stated that uh, red meat is bad, uh, causing cancer. So you mentioned there was a mice model. I, I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand. So it's a mice model. It's the, the same. And what's the diet the mice are eating? So having? these mice are knocked out in the CMAH, the same mice that we have. Um, and they were fed with um, porcine submaxillary mucins. So it's the <laughs> porous and submaxillary mucins, so the <laughs> which means that they took um, uh, salivary glands from pigs, mashed it up, but, but, and but mice are rodents, right? They're rodents, yes. They're but, not supposed to. They're not supposed to, yes. But if you wanted to mimic, what is it in the diet that uh, that can be incorporated into cancers? So these mice uh, naturally, uh, some of them will develop cancers, like humans, uh, at some point in their lives. So they fed the mice over a three-year period. And then they looked in those mice that were, uh, that were fed with a new 5GC and at the same time got antibodies. And in those mice that had both the antibodies and the sugar ex expressed on the cancers, those cancers grow, grew bigger compared to the control group, 
which did not get the porous and submaxillary mucins, but they got the human sugar but, but the fact instead. But the fact that the diet is so not even remotely close to the natural diet that mice... I can tell you have. that this was a 10-year experiment uh, because it was very difficult to know what exactly in... How do you want to introduce the sugar in the diet? I can tell you that we tried different... I didn't do that, but I was there when it was done. So they tried um, to just add the free sugar to the drinking of the mice, and that was just washed away immediately. So that really doesn't matter. So the, apparently the sugar has to be conjugated to some proteins to enter the body as it is, without being washed away. Um, we don't know exactly um, what's the turnover time. And, and another application of, um, because the problem really matters when you have both the sugar and the antibodies. Not, it doesn't cause the cancer as it is. If you just have the sugars on the cell surface, that wouldn't matter. But when the antibodies are circulating, uh, they bind, and if they are at low levels, they, they cause chronic inflammation in that area. And that chronic inflammation adds fuel to the fire in a way that it promotes the cancer growth. But if you had these antibodies, high affinity, targeted to a certain glycan structure at a high level, you could kill it. <laughs> well, let's thank Verit again.